instabilities that happen at the interface between, between two fluids. So before talking about ferro fluids, which are magnetic fluids, let me talk a little bit about non-magnetic fluids. So the classic uh, Safman-Taylor instability is the classic uh, viscous finger problem. Takes place in a Hillishaw cell, which consists of two parallel plates, narrowly spaced. You confine two fluids in between, and you inject one fluid into the other. Right. So if you inject the less viscous fluid into the more viscous one, so do we have a point? Okay. So. Less viscous fluid into a more viscous one. For instance, uh, oil into water. The initially flat interface between the fluids becomes unstable, and you develop several finger-like structures as one of the fluids is pushed towards the other. Right. So eventually, one of the fingers dominates over the others in the dynamics. Right. And you come up with one finger that is half of the width of the cell. Thank you. Wow. Hi. <laughs> Alright, so um, if you inject the other way around, so if you inject oil into water, you don't you don't have this instability. So the interface would be stable in the inverse situation. Alright, so this, this is the so-called uh, rectangular geometry. And this is what we call the radial or circular geometry. Uh, the initial uh, uh, droplet is circular and you inject fluid from the middle of the cell, right? So you make a hole here in your plate and you inject the less viscous fluid into the more viscous one. And the, initially, the, the interface initially grows circular, but at some critical value of the radius, it uh, starts to branch and then you see a lot of uh, bifurcations in this viscous fingering and at the end of the day you, ha you have this highly uh, branched structure, right? So this problem has been studied uh, several decades now uh, due to its, its similarities with uh, several other problems. Uh, this, this pattern is going to look a lot with uh, electrical discharge and also DLA so this, it's a kind of Laplacian growth which has uh, parallels with uh, several other uh, phenomena. Okay? So it's, from the theoretical point of view, it's very interesting because it's, the equations are quite simple, but it's a moving modern problem and uh, the, the interface evolution is nonlinear, right? The dynamics is nonlinear. Um, it's two-dimensional, effectively two-dimensional. And we are worried about incompressible, immiscible fluids, so there is surface tension between fluids as well. All right. There are other ways of destabilizing the interface between the fluids. Instead of injecting, if you inject, is the difference is the vis in viscosity between the fluids that generates the instabilities. But if instead of injecting, you place a denser fluid uh, droplet surrounded by a less denser fluid. So suppose this is uh, water and this is air. And you rotate the Hillishaw cell. So here we are in the rotating frame. Okay? The initially circular interface becomes uh, mm -hmm. uh, unstable due to the centrifugally driven force. Right, so now it's the difference in densities that generate the, the viscous finger. But if you change the viscous contrast between the fluids, the patterns are different. So you could, this would be, um, this fluid is, is viscous, but the other one has negligible uh, viscosity. But here, if they are comparable, then you have this pinching phenomenon happening. So some droplets, satellite droplets, pinch at the end of the fingers, right? Okay. So there are important applications of this problem, and one of them is uh, the oil recovery process. If you want to recover oil, oil is initially trapped inside porous rocks. You have to 
deep two wells and then you have to inject water in one well and re extract oil from the other until you start recovering uh, water instead of oil. Then your extraction stops. But the equations that rule this dynamics are the same as the Hirschel cell. So this is porous media and the equation we are dealing here is uh, Darcy's law. I don't know if you are familiar with but it says that the velocity of the flow goes with minus the gradient of the pressure. It's the same as in the Hilleschel cell. Okay? So you could see a Hilleschel cell as a big pore, if you want. Um, all right, so viscous finger take place because uh, uh, water is less viscous than, than the oil. And eventually, one of the fingers hit that fraction well, but you still have. Uh, oil trapped inside the rock, right? So you want to avoid these instabilities in this kind of process. So this is a nice result that um, my collaborators in Recife have uh, uh, achieved. If you inject at a constant rate water into oil, you get a branched finger structure. But if you inject the same amount, amount of fluid in the same time, but you allow the injection to be varied. So you have a pump and you can control the rate of injection. What would be the best injection rate you could choose to avoid instabilities? So they came up with uh, simple calculations to show that a linear profile for the injection suppresses the most uh, the fingering. So it doesn't suppress completely, but you inject the same amount of fluid with minimizing the amplitude of the, of the fingers, right? So it was quite nice result. All right, so let me introduce some features of magnetic fluids. What would be ferrofluids? Um, ferrofluids are magnetic suspensions. They are artificially built. They are colloids. We have here uh, nanometer-sized particles with a core which is magnetic, so um, you have a monon domain here of, of a magnetic core, which could be iron or magnetite. And um, so you have uh, dipoles here immersed in a non magnetic fluid, which could be water or oil. Then, uh, if you want this suspension to be stable, you have to do a proper chemical treatment of the particles. So you, you put some surfactant or you put some ions that stabilize the, the, the particles and avoid them to glue together and eventually uh, fall apart. In your so they are made in a way they are pretty stable, right? And so I'm, there's a lot of physics going on here in the, in the microscopic scale, but I am concerned with the macroscopic scale, right? So in the macroscopic scale, we end up with uh, fluid, which pretty much behaves as a Newtonian fluid when in the absence of an applied magnetic field. But if you apply a magnetic field, you induce a flow in this suspension. So it's a magnetizable suspension, right? So you could drag it, or, and also there's this interesting phenomenon happening here, which is at the interface, you see these instabilities taking place, these peaks, right? So I'm concerned about these instabilities happening at the interface of a ferrofluid. So although the, the particles are ferromagnetic, the overall suspension is paramagnetic. In the absence of an applied field, it has zero magnetization. The dipoles are randomly oriented. And when you apply an external magnetic field, they align and produce a magnetization. And if they are aligned and there is a gradient of an external field, of a, a local magnetic field, then they feel a magnetic force. And that's why you can drag the whole suspension. Okay? All right, so there are several applications for these fluids. Uh, you could use them to um, design smart adhesives that you can switch a field on and off and make it glue more or less. You could use it in medical treatment. If you inject this uh, fur fluids in the, in the region, for instance, a cancer uh, tumor, you want to kill, 
uh, you can oscillate a magnetic field in radio frequency and you can um, burn locally a uh, uh, cancer cell, for instance. And there are some other modern applications. You can use these magnetic particles to stick them in, into a uh, cell membrane and make some uh, rheology experiments and, and measure elasticity and other properties of, of cells. Or you could use it to design pumps into uh, microchannel devices and so on. So th there are a lot of applications. But I'm a theoretical physicist. I like um, to keep close to experiments, but I'm, I'm concerned about the nonlinear dynamics on this interface and uh, if there are any stationary solutions and so on. I would like to classify the kinds of patterns we get in this kind of uh, instabilities. So what happens if you take a fluid and put it in a helical cell? So this, this is, a, is the fluid, the black one. This is air, right? There is gravity point downwards. We will flip this uh, helical cell. And we see that instabilities take place. This is the Rayleigh, uh, Rayleigh Taylor instability. Uh, due to the difference in, in densities and viscosities, we have this uh, fingering patterns here. I will stop the video, but then I can finish afterwards. Sorry? There is no magnetic field, just no magnetic field. so this, this is zero field. They just behave as a common liquid. If you use oil, you get the same kind of pattern, right? But now things change a lot if you apply a perpendicular field. So the field is applied perpendicular to the plate. It's the same for a fluid. But now you have a combination of uh, this Rayleigh really, really Taylor instability with magnetic effects. So you get this labyrinth-like patterns. So this happens because um, now you have a magnetized, uh, magnetized fingers. They try to avoid each other. They are like parallel dipoles. They, they repel each other. But you also have um, surface tension. So the area tends to be minimized. minimized and then you get this uh, competing effects. We will, I will continue the other videos, just you can see the area is... The surface tension tries to minimize, minimize the area, which would be the length here, if you, if you are you seeing this. Yeah, but clearly the area is much less. Yes, because it's a competing effect the, the thing with the magnetic, with yes, the, the yes, magnetic. that's right. All right. Okay, so that was the rectangular geometry. Now the radial geometry. Uh, if you have initially circular droplet for a fluid droplet and you apply a perpendicular magnetic field, then you have again this kind of labyrinth, but now it's a radial version of it. So the fingers tend to bifurcate and you can try to determine the number of fingers and uh, what kind of uh, uh, bifurcated fingers will arise in this, in this kind of experiments. And the nice thing about magnetic fluids is that if you change the magnetic field configuration, you get different kind of pattern formation. So now I apply a perpendicular field plus a in-plane rotating magnetic field, and then we get a different pattern, right? So first was perpendicular, now the rotating was applied. Then the fingers start to curl. There are some competition among the fingers. And at the end, you, you get a pattern like this, spiral-like patterns. Now, if you invert the order, you first apply the rotating field and then the perpendicular, something quite different happened. And now they will apply the perpendicular. So you have some instability at the interest in. <laughs> there is a topological, topological change in the, in the droplet. It breaks into several islands. And uh, the explanation is that energetically, it's more favorable to break into islands than to continue with a uh, big domain. So, uh, I mean, 
this is not completely understood, but I mean, you can you can do some calculations to show that this this is a minimization of uh, magnetic energy. So let me show equations for you. I, I promise this will be the only slide full of equations. Okay, so. Uh, I want to set continuous equations for this magnetic fluids. We can start with Navier Stokes equation. Um, these are inertial terms, this is pressure, this is viscosity, uh, the viscous term, and this is uh, the magnetic body force, which comes from the fact that we have a magnetized volume in the presence of the gradient of a field, right? So this is the, the magnetic extra force. Uh, in the geometry of a Hilschel cell, we can simplify this. We can neglect inertial terms, which is good, and get average the rest. So we get this would be usual Darcy's law for usual fluids, and there is an extra term which depends on the uh, magnetic effects, right? Um, there is another another difference which comes from the pressure jump. If you cross an interface between a magnetic fluid and a non-magnetic one, right, there is the usual Young-Laplace uh, term here for uh, curvature and surface tension, but there's an extra term due to the fact that magnetization has a discontinuity, right? So this we call magnetic uh, traction, magnetic normal traction, right? And this is the term that is responsible for the sharp fingers. So where magnetization is normal, fingers tend to be sharp. All right. So we can write down the equations if we are in a potential uh, uh, flux in terms of um, velocity potential. It's a Laplacian problem. But here there is some non-local non term, right? This term also depends on velocity. All right, so the, the, the equations look pretty simple, but at the end, the evolution of the interface is non-trivial. So usually we don't have a full analytical solution for this. We have to do perturbative analysis or uh, numerical simulations. Or, as I will show you, we can have fully nonlinear stationary solutions to this problem. So I will show some of them. In addition, there's something I'm not showing you which is, uh, these are the equations for the flow, but there, there are also equations for the uh, magnetic field. So you, you must solve magnetostatic equations. Usually, magnetization uh, relaxes much faster in a, in a time scale, which is much smaller than the flow scale. So you can consider that you are in a magnetostatic regime. So you must solve also uh, Laplace equations for the uh, magnetic potential, right? And scalar potential. Okay, so this was the introduction, <laughs> and, uh, and now uh, what I would like to do is uh, let's try different kind of magnetic field configurations and see what we can do analytically, what we can calculate, and um, keep in mind that I'm searching for no trivial stationary solution, and that's because I'm able to calculate analytically, some, in some cases, uh, a fully nonlinear stationary solution. And I want to compare them with a perturbative analysis, right? Okay. So first, in the rectangular geometry, this is an experiment, which I haven't done. Um, this is a ferro fluid in a Hilschel cell. This is just air. If you apply a low uniform magnetic field in this direction, okay? So that there is gravity downwards and the magnetic field upwards. If the field is uh, not very intense, the, inter the flat interface is stable. You don't see any perturbation, it keeps flat. But there is a critical value of the magnetic field which uh, instabilities become to, to appear in a critical uh, wavelength. And if you increase further, these uh, structures um, become sharper, and, and you see this periodic array of sharp fingers. Um, these are all static, 
Okay, so if you apply the magnetic field, it begins in initially flat interface and it grows until it reaches these stationary profiles. All right, so the linear stability analysis shows us that this is the linear growth rate, this is the wave number. If the field is low, there are no unstable modes, then you expect the interface to remain flat. But there is a critical value of the field in which one mode becomes uh, a marginal mode, and if you increase further, it will be unstable. So this, this, wave, uh, this, this uh, uh, wave number corresponds to this wavelength, okay, for the critical value. And if you increase further, then you have a band of unstable modes, and the fastest growing mode will determine the uh, periodicity of this uh, structure. Mm -hmm. So linear stability analysis gives you the critical field and gives you the wavelength, but doesn't give you the shape, doesn't tell you that the tips will be sharp and the bottom will be uh, broad. This it doesn't give you, okay? Where do you have the zero mode, the neutral mode, zero, zero, is The zero mode yeah. is um, zero. The growth is zero. It would mean a translation in, in these. It would just mean a translation. So zero mode would be everything up, upwards, or down. So the, the zero mode. The, the, the position of that of that of the interface is neutral, so you can move it. The zero of the interface is always at the same place. So the the place where the interface okay, was it, flat is the middle. Mode, you have a mode taken by zero, which is uh, you will say the the position displacement of the surface is neutral. So it's neutral, yes. Is that the position of the, of the interface? Is yes. The no, no, that's right. Yes. This is strange. With gravity, this is strange. Mm -hmm. yeah, but this is the but, but you mean, this, it's a pool of fur fluid, so it doesn't have where to fall. So this is a semi infinite system? So yeah, semi infinite. Yeah, that's right. Gravity. Yes. So it's different from the other one which I showed that they, they are falling. Um, all right, so um, I've told you before that magnetic force um, depends on the gradient of the magnetic field. And this is a uniform field, so you don't have a gradient. So here, uh, the important thing is when this uh, piece of magnetic fluid gets magnetized, it produces a demagnetizing field. So it's a fringing field, right? So this is the applied field. It doesn't... Uh, produce forces, but this one produces. So it, is, it depends on the shape. The magnetic forces depend on the shape of the profile. So it's, it's a quite complicated problem. All right, so if you want to describe the shapes, you want to go beyond linear order. So we, we went to the next nonlinear, next perturbative uh, term, which is uh, second order. Now we have a uh, coupling between the Fourier modes, okay? And we wanted to keep things as simple as we could. So this, this is a coupling between, theoretically, an infinite number of modes. And we truncate this series only for two modes. So we are only considering the fastest growing mode and the first harmonic of it, which lies outside the band, the linear stability band. It's, it's uh, a stable, linearly stable. So if you do this with only two modes, any initial, initially perturbed interface with these two modes uh, will grow and the modes will saturate. This is the fastest growing mode, this is the first harmonic, and they saturate here, right? And this corresponds to this profile, static profile, which is qualitatively uh, in agreement with the experiments. The teeth are sharp and the bottom are, is, is uh, uh, broad, okay? So, Quantitatively, we, we cannot achieve, we should insert more modes in order to get a sharp interface like this one. But with only two modes, we can get dynamically the correct prediction. So this is a stable uh, solution, uh, a stable stationary solution for the problem. It would correspond to a fixed, uh, to a stable fixed point. Uh, something interesting happens if you tilt the magnetic field you can induce waves on this profile. 
So these waves also saturate in amplitude and you are able to calculate numerically these uh, velocities, the propagation velocities. So there are uh, nonlinear waves. We can show that these, uh, they depend on the amplitude of the waves. Okay. The travel waves. The you mean traveling waves? Traveling waves, yes. So it moves. It moves, it moves. Mm -hmm. This stationary profile moves. Yeah. What, 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 what is this? Where is the energy coming from? From the magnetic field, which you must keep turned on. It's a, it's a constant magnetic field? It's a constant magnetic field. Yeah, but it drives energy it's from the tilting. Mm -hmm. It's from the tilting, so... Yeah. You break the symmetry left, right, and then... Uh, yeah, you, could, you could break the symmetry, uh, but could not move. You need a potential system. Yeah. So it's not potential. Yeah, but this it is it is potential. I don't think so. Sorry, I mean, I mean if it's moving, there cannot be. But I'm sorry. I, I just I mean, forgot to mention one thing. Okay, uh, there is a parallel flow as well. Uh, so parallel flow. Uh, I'm injecting oh, fluids. In this direction. Yes, there is a basal <coughs> flow. So this is uh, this is the cell, and if you apply uh, the same pressure difference. Here, this there is a flow, basal flow between um, okay. parallel flow. So that's right. Moves. Yes, that's right. Yes. But I'm sorry. You, I was but then you might also have a symmetry without the magnetic field. Yes, you can. Um, the thing but was, but we, we already. The flow is the symmetry of the flag. The wave can, does not need to be symmetric. No, in, uh, in without the without the magnetic field, uh, you can make a um, um, change of reference frame in the in that, and that would you still get you still get traveling waves if yeah. without the field. Exactly. We wanted to manipulate them. Okay. Okay. So the All right. So now let me talk a little bit about the radial geometry. So we have now initially circular interface. Um, we knew from from the rotating helical cell that there are some analytical <coughs> stationary solutions to this problem but it happens to be that these solutions they are unstable so you cannot see them in actual experiments right so these are theoretical results but I mean you could not find them in experiments so we thought maybe we can add a magnetic force stabilizing and perhaps we get a stationary solution for the problem so we chose to get this to use this uh, current car the, the field produced by a current carrying wire. If this is a pool of fur fluid and this is a, just a wire, if there is no current, so nothing happens, but if, you, if there is an electric current passing, it generates a field which uh, goes like 1 over R. So the gradient of this applied field points inwards, radially inwards. So it pulls the fluid towards the center, towards the wire. And it's a stabilizing effect, right? So if you now confine the, in a Hillshaw cell, this alone would not be able to produce instabilities. It would stabilize the circle drop, just stabilize even more. But this is destabilizing. So we are rotating the Hillshaw cell and applying the field of, of a current carrying wire. Try to find a stable solution. So we write down our uh, Darcy's law with magnetic terms. This is just an extra term if you want to include more complicated, complicated magnetic suspensions, which are uh, magnetorheological fluids. Uh, I won't get into details of it. And then we are able to calculate stationary solutions. These are fully nonlinear. They are non-perturbative. The way we do it is just by equilibrating all, all the forces at the interface between the fluids. So we have capillary forces, centrifugal forces, and magnetic forces. When we do this, uh, since uh, capillary uh, depends on the curvature, we can write down an equation for the curvature of the, that a uh, plane interface would have in order to uh, balance all the forces of the problem. Okay? So we can calculate these stationary solutions. And we get a family of stationary solutions. So this is not a time series of events. These are separate solutions. 
Okay? If you increase the magnetic field, the solutions tend to have less fingers because the field is stabilized. If you increase rotation, you tend to develop this pinching phenomena at the tips of the droplets, which we would expect from pure rotation uh, setup. Okay? So they, they look a lot, look at this, this solution, compare with numerical simulations previously done. They look a lot with numerical simulations, so perhaps they could be stationary solutions. So, sorry, the, uh, do you recover the this is analytic? Uh, These are analytical analytic analytic calculations? Analytic? Well, it's, it's not pinching in time. It's just you see that the interface tend to cross, to, to self-intercept. When we do these calculations, we get a lot of interfaces and also self-intersecting inter self, uh, interfaces. But for the physical interface, which don't overlap, when you increase rotation, they tend to, they tend to get next. So that, that's what we are calling, calling a pinching tennis. But I mean, it's not pinching in the sense that it's not timing, time evolving. All right, this is if you include the extra term for magnetorheological fluids, you get different kinds of uh, stationary solutions. <coughs> and we, what we have seen is that if you, this is the Fourier power spectrum of the Zach solution, the analytical solution. If we use a weakly nonlinear second order analysis um, and we impose the stationary regime, we see that with only three Fourier modes, we are able to qualitatively reproduce this uh, interface. So we map them into a perturbative stationary uh, interface, and now we can analyze what happens to the dynamics of the system. So what, what happens is that these solutions, there are actually uh, saddle points dynamically. So if you make a perturbation and you end up below this plane, you will, uh, this corresponds to this one. If you make a perturbation in this stationary solution that you are here for, then you will tend to go back to the circle, circular drop, right? But if there is a perturbation that gives you uh, this upper configuration, these fingers tend to grow, right? And eventually, the weakly nonlinear analysis doesn't work anymore, and probably there is some pinching going on which is uh, beyond these analytical problems. All right, so actually, these stationary solutions are still unstable, right? So they exist. If you could shape the interface of, of your fluid, you would notice that there is a reduction, reduction in the, in the, a slowing down in the dynamics near these solutions, but you, you cannot grow, start with a nearly circular solution and, and get end up with this this kind of solution. All right, so we have also tried a radial magnetic field. This is feasible uh, experimentally. If you have a pair of uh, Helmholtz coil, instead of uh, uh, putting currents which are parallel and generate a uniform field, if you use anti-parallel anti uh, uh, setup, you produce a field which in this plane is grows with the radio distance. So if you get average this field, it seems to be a field that has some divergence, but that's because we are taking off the two-dimensional character of the field, okay? But it's a field that tends to pull the flow fluid outwards, radially outwards, <coughs> okay? And the funny thing is that this, this field uh, produces a radial force just like these, the centrifugal force. So the difference between this problem with the radial magnetic field and the centrifugal one is at this pressure jump condition, the term I talked about, which is the magnetic normal traction term, right? So that's, that's the main difference between the non-magnetic and the magnetic. So we get some uh, starfish-shaped, uh, symmetric shapes, which are uh, stationary, and if you um, decrease the normal traction uh, contribution, you get back to the usual non-magnetic centrifugal problem, okay? But they are still unstable. So we've done some numerical simulations 
Um, this is a phase field technique, which is something I've been doing with uh, Jauma. This is the moon. Uh, this is a um, continuous field that mimics the interface between two fluids. It's regularizing the, the interface. We see that in the simulations, uh, shades get pretty close to the stationary analytical solutions, but at the end, they get, they get out of it. It, it. They don't stay there, right? So they are unstable. <laughs> okay, so the last try to get a stable solution was the following. Now we rotate the helical cell and we apply a radial magnetic field. And the main difference now is that both centrifugal force and radial field has the same contributions to the force in the bulk of the fluid. So we can tune rotation to cancel out uh, the, the magnetic force at the bulk and end up only with the normal traction contribution at the interface. So this is the main difference between this and all the other setups which couldn't find any stationary solutions is that the only destabilizing effect is due to a pressure jump condition. Okay? So there is another problem which is like this, which is related to tissue growth, where you also have stationary solutions due to a pressure jump condition. Okay, so in this case, we did find solutions. They look like polygons, right? Um, we impose commensurability to the solutions, and we are able to, when, when this delta parameter crosses the axis, there is a, a commensurable solution to the problem. So we find all the commensurable solutions to a given set of physical parameters, okay? So to a given set of physical parameters, we have this curve crosses the axis 14 times. So we have 14 solutions. We still have non-physical solutions, which are self-intersecting. We get rid of them. Only the physical ones are those, okay? Polygon shape solutions. These are analytical, fully nonlinear, right? And, and if you increase uh, the magnetic field, I mean, if you increase the contribution to the pressure jump, the fingers tend to be sharper and sharper because uh, the magnetic normal traction tends to make the fingers sharp. And we can map these analytical solutions, fully nonlinear, to the weakly nonlinear solutions from the second order perturbative analysis. We have a good agreement with uh, three Fourier modes. All right, so we can make a stability analysis and indeed see that this case, in this case, we have stationary solutions, stationary stable solutions. If you if you begin with a circular droplet and you make a random perturbation, it will grow towards a, a stationary solution. These are the Fourier amplitudes, and they all saturate uh, at, at long times, for long times, and indicating that we have indeed an uh, exact stable stationary solution. This was quite a big deal to us because, I mean, this is the only problem we can do it exactly in the Hilleshaw neurology. So this is the, the only other related problem would be this tissue growth problem where we have stable is at stationary solution. Okay, so let me just, I have only two more slides. Uh, comment a little bit what happens if now the fluids are not immiscible. They are miscible. So they can mix. For instance, you get ferro fluid and outside you put the carrier fluid of the ferro fluid. So you put the solvent outside, right? So now there is diffusion of magnetic particles and also there is flow. So here is what it will happen in, uh, if you apply a perpendicular uniform magnetic field for immiscible fluids. You get this finger, uh, this labyrinth-like patterns, three fingers here. And here is what happens 
in a equivalent situation with miscible fluids. So the patterns are quite different. And if you take a look, if you take a zoom here at the micro scale, uh, uh, smaller scales, not micro, micro, you see diffusion and you see labyrinth patterns in diffusion, right? So you, this is what I'm trying to convince uh, Emilio and Cristóbal to, to do, mm -hmm. try to use some miscible magnetic fluids. This is what happens if you use a radiomagnetic field. Uh, uh, the force is radially pointy outwards, and you have this sunflower-like pattern. So there is mixing of the of the phases, but also there is kind of fingers here, right? And this spread. And um, in this work, they have uh, shown that this this uh, structures they follow certain power laws, and this correspond to a super diffusive uh, regime because magnetic forces is pushing uh, particles out, out, outwards. Another interesting phenomenon in, in uh, miscible magnetic fluids would be uh, phase separation. So take a Hilleshaw cell and take only one magnetic fluid, one, one ferrofluid, okay? So at the absence of a magnetic field, the, the suspension is homogeneous. But if you use intense enough magnetic field, there is some microphase separation. I don't know if you can see over there. But here, there are the formation of short needles in the fluids. This is a side view, and this is a top view. So there is a separation between a gas-like phase and a liquid-like phase. So the needles would correspond to a liquid-like phase of the magnetic particles. And the, the, the rest of the homogeneous fluid would behave as a gas of magnetic particles. So there's a lot of discussion in the literature about this and um, a lot of thermodynamic analysis, but I think there's still lacking pattern information analysis. So this, this problem is known for quite a while, but still uh, equations for pattern information, I don't think they are... They are, they are Exhausted. Yeah. So if you increase the magnetic field, these needles tend to merge and form columns, and eventually they percolate the whole uh, the whole um, axis of the, the the perpendicular axis of the helical cell, and then at the end you get uh, uh, an effectively uh, two-dimensional pattern formation in this. So theory has predicted that this should be uh, hexagonal lattices signal lattice, but in fact they are kind of glassy. And if you keep increasing the magnetic field, uh, these columns, they form stripes. And it, this, this kind of pattern formation would resemble the labyrinth pattern formation. If instead of uniform field, you use a non-uniform field produced by a, a micron-sized sphere, you also get the condensation of phases here and here, the, the, the micro B, and uh, it has a peculiar shape. It has some cloud shapes, right? So there's a lot of things going on here, and um, thermodynamically, the, the problem is quite complicated, quite rich, and I think there are some things to explore um, in pattern formation in this. All right. Um, most of the work I've shown you has been done in collaboration with Professor José Miranda, which was my former advisor in Recife. Um, I'm also trying to do some experiments now in collaboration with Italo in Maceo. We are doing uh, magneto-wetting uh, uh, experiments. It's quite difficult to understand the experiments, so if anyone has a clue for this kind of, of, of problems, when you put uh, dynamic contact angles, things get quite messy. So there are a lot of effects going on. Um, this is some advertisement of Maceo. Here is where it's located. It's a quite nice place to be. I live approximately here. <laughs> so we have a nice uh, beach over there. These are near, nearby uh, locations. So you could take some trips and see some canyons and 
natural swimming pools in Maragogi. I don't think uh, Emilio has been there. No, no you should, should come, should come back. Finish. Yeah. I don't remember this place. <laughs> no, you haven't been. So you must come back and yeah. I will take you there. All right, so we have uh, 29 through professor. We have 16 graduate students. We are quite, quite a big group. We are active in, in research. Some of our uh, research fields are here. And if you are interested in visiting us, just send me an email. All right, so I will leave you with the conclusions. And thank you for your attention. Yes, they are in the magnetostatic equations. So I can I can write down the equations for you. No, no, <laughs> um, I mean, not, they are quite simple. I mean, um, and the boundary conditions, right? Um, normal. Okay, so um, here you should also insert the dependence of uh, magnetization on 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 the local magnetic field, which usually is parallel. But this is a Langevin curve. Okay, so for solving the magnetostatic equations you must include the orientation of the field and then the torque equations you are talking about we are already talking about the equilibrium configuration of them so when you calculate the local magnetic field in these equations they are already giving the the direction that the dipole should be pointing yes so we are neglecting these dynamics but for instance in these experiments where you have uh, um, this this, this experiment where you have a rotating field, if you have a time-varying <coughs> magnetic field, then you should worry about the magnetization dynamics. Yeah, especially in the radial field, you, know, you have the gradient. So um, no, the radial field, no, because the, the magnetic field is static in that case. But if, if the magnetic field is static in the sense of the applied field is static, right? So the, the flow dynamics is much slower than the magnetization one. But here, when you are rotating, the external field, or you, if you are oscillating the magnetic field, then you should worry about magnetization dynamics. And actually, here in this problem, due to rotation, magnetization is trying to follow the applied field, but it's not parallel. So it's not the same as this, this other case. If the, the field is time varying, then you should worry about relaxation of magnetization. More questions? I have one myself. Yep. I think it's well, probably a difficult question, but in all, all those problems involving Laplacian growth, the, there is always, uh, you ne nearly never can, can find the small amplitude solutions. I mean, the instability grows and uh, only, only you do some, some tricks to compensate the poor forces, the, as you did in the last example, yeah. to, to, to really find uh, small amplitude solutions. Uh, why is this? So, is, is there any it's easy to understand from what is determining the equations that make the, the growth to go unmounted as far as, as soon as it becomes unstable. I don't find it easy to understand, and I mean, I think studying these stationary solutions could give a clue of what's happening. Because although these stationary solutions they do exist in other cases, they are unstable, and they should be relevant for the dynamics. So somehow, fingers grow and avoid these stationary solutions. And uh, this is not clear enough, I think. So usually, usually they are, they grow unbounded except for this particular case. Yes. Any other question? No, thank you, Sergio. Right. Thank you. Thank you.